Hello YouTube, my name is Ben Schroff, owner and president and founder of Mechanized Cleaning Solutions Inc., a reclamation pressure washing specialty contractor in the Seattle area. Specifically, we're in Redmond, Washington, just about uh, 10 or 15 minutes east of the city, in between the city and the mountains, up here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Uh, welcome to uh, a really, what is probably going to be a very long and detailed, multi-part video series for how-tos for reclamation pressure washing or environmentally friendly, stormwater friendly pressure washing, where you got to pick up all the wash water. Um, let's see, uh, reclamation pressure washing is all that we do. And uh, it uh, basically, uh, it has, in, our, in our case, has been developed to uh, a very high degree. And, uh, you know, I've been at this for a while now, I kind of had my head down in a bubble for the last seven, eight, nine, ten years, I guess, maybe. And, uh, oh, the business has finally, you know, uh, more or less entered uh, its full expression, you know, that's going to continue to grow and transform a little bit more. But most of the hard work has been done. This is, um, uh, like I say, this has been developed to a, a very high degree. And uh, I just, you know, coming up out of this bubble for the last uh, seven or eight years, I'm looking around, kind of come up for air and seeing what's going on out there as far as reclamation. And um, I honestly, I was kind of just surprised to see that uh, it, the industry at large still appears to be just like in the very beginning of stages of figuring this out. And uh, I'm really feeling excited about wanting to, sh to pass on what we've learned to help other contractors out who have uh, been thinking about or maybe are even committed to uh, making this transition into stormwater friendly pressure washing because uh, you know reclamation wastewater reclamation is with respect to pressure washing has been a very hot and uncomfortable topic in the industry for a long time now and uh, you know for a long time it was just you know it was kind of like this maybe thing and contractors were you know thinking that maybe it you know the imperative to pick up wash water wouldn't become like this for sure permanent thing that everyone's going to have to adjust to but uh it's definitely going that way and uh the uh and a lot of companies are still kind of trying to fly under the radar I, you know i'm i'm out interacting in the industry quite a bit and uh what i see out there is really it's just kind of the wild west right now and um but reclamation is all that we do we are specialists at it and uh, uh you know probably every business owner feels like they're the best at what they do but um <laughs> if i look around and i kind of see what's going on around us with other companies in our area and really there's just like not really anyone else out there who's doing what we're doing or at least to the scale that we're doing except maybe i think there's one other company who they're pretty good at it um but even they even they don't really uh kind of directly compete with us i mean they do a little bit or our, our, our our scopes kind of overlap a little bit, but um, our situation has just become like very industrial in nature. And uh, uh, it's all commercial industrial. We basically don't do any any residential right now because um, honestly, there's really no need to. Um, there's probably a point in time later on where, you know, I'll stand up like a residential division of workers who really just are, are, are specializing in working in, with people's houses and house washing and stuff like that. But really, our reclamation is, uh, it's a multi-tiered transition that really, in, in terms, as far as the way the government's thinking about uh, checking people into making this stormwater friendly transition, there's this big plan, basically, of an enforcement plan that basically started out starts out um, years back with uh, regulating authorities kind of going off after the biggest uh, polluters first, the biggest dischargers, the biggest point source, point sources of the pollution. We're talking like big industrial factories, organizations like Boeing or maybe grocery store chains or factories and in industrial sections of cities and things like that. And that was like referred to as tier one or phase one. Uh, phase two was to move into like commercial, to move into the commercial arena and start getting businesses like smaller businesses, restaurants, uh, even grocery stores, um, gas stations, things along those lines, you know, retail stores, get them to do their stuff in uh, an environmentally friendly way, get a grip on that stormwater pollution. And then apparently, I don't know if, I don't really, 
I don't really know if the big plan is still unfolding, unfolding according to the way it was originally conceived, but the third phase was then to move out into the residential neighborhoods and get people in their houses and their apartments to stop washing the cars in a driveway and things like that. And to some degree, the plan was happening in all three phases simultaneously, but for the most part, there was the biggest uh, allocation of funds to go after it in that, in that order, uh, descending from the highest polluters down to the lowest level polluters. So, uh, let's see, what can we say about that? Um, it's pretty clear now, it's pretty clear now that the federal mandate and then which filters down to the state's Department of Ecology and then to the local counties and cities is that that enforcement plan is in full effect now. People are seeing this in every state, in every jurisdiction. Pressure washers, professional companies are getting busted for flushing water down the storm drains. And uh, th in our case, we were extremely early adopters uh, operating from a severe competitive disadvantage, um, which as hard as it was, was actually really beneficial to us. You know, I used to be, for the longest time, I was just really unsure about whether or not our business was even going to stay, but I was determined to make this work or run the fucking thing right into the ground trying. And uh, that's what I did. But fortunately, it did work out for us. There was just enough oddball work out there where reclamation was really the only choice to get that work done. And uh, there was also enough publicly funded work where since there was nobody else really you know, capable of doing like, you know, some hospital, some taxpayer funded hospitals, parking garage could go in and clean that thing and pick up all the water. Uh, and that, there was enough of that to keep our heads just above water, plus one or two really progressive prog property management companies that uh, really uh, helped keep us afloat during those first really painful years. Um, but yeah, the, the enforcement now is full effect. It's very obvious uh, now that pressure washing companies at large are going to have to make this transition into reclamation pressure washing instead of just normal pressure washing for the most part, or face the prospect of going out of business, attempting to fly under the radar, or getting in a really a lot of trouble, um, especially if you get caught more than once. So uh, what I really want to do, what's interesting for me now at this point, now that I have more time, because we have employees now, we're just a lot busier and I can't really... I can't really be the do everything guy that I was when I first started, you know, when I when we first got going, I was, uh, it was just me and I had, you know, a pool of friends, really part-time workers would help me out on big projects, but this, the, you know, we've gotten busier and I just, I can't really be on the jobs anymore. It's more of me running around doing bids, fixing stuff, building new machines in the shop so that we can do our work. And, uh, we have employees now, which means I, uh, I have more time and, um, yeah it's been a it's been a long interesting road going through this transition it's really painful but what i've learned is it doesn't need to be that painful and i want to uh, have now i have a you know a really strong intention i want to pass on what we've learned so that other contractors looking to go through this transition can do so with uh, you know a minimal amount absolute minimal amount of uh, pain and financial expenditure and uh pain what I mean in the form of making mistakes and le learning the hard way you know losing money um, <clears throat> I don't uh, have it there's nothing in me that wants to keep all this a secret you know the, the tricks and stuff that we've learned because uh, in our situation this whole process has been developed to a very high degree and I want to pass that on I actually want to elevate the entire industry and I think competition is a good thing <coughs> because uh, you know not having competitions like growing up a rich kid you're just woefully underprepared for any kind of adversity and um you know, looking back, all that, uh, you know, that that pressure from that competitive crucible, you know, when we were basically competing on just so such unlevel ground really sharpened us and uh, uh, turned us into a really badass company, you know, learning how to do more with less. And so I don't really have a, I don't, uh, I don't by any stretch think that that process is over. And I'm not really even thinking that I want that to stop. So um, it, the, the motivation for me to provide this information really um, is coming from a more, I would consider, a, a perspective of understanding that uh, I don't need things to be easy. You know what I mean? I don't want to move into a situation where, you know, everything's just given to me now because we're just in this really good position and, um, you know, from being way early adopters. I, I want... 
I, I still want the, the world to keep kicking my ass in the form of uh, providing me stiff competition so that it'll keep us sharp because I think that's good for everyone, especially us. So, uh, and not only that, I just, I just want to help people out, you know, um, um, in a lot of ways, I, uh, I, I think back on my experience of like jumping into this whole reclamation thing, you know, probably prematurely, but, uh, it, honestly, the the process was so painful and, and scary and just, I mean, like the first five years in business, first, at least first two, three, for sure. I just uh, wake up every day, you know, and have a panic attack, sucking my thumb in the shower because I was just freaked out about going bankrupt and just not having any money to operate on and just being severely outcompeted. And, uh, you know, but if you keep your head down and you stick with that and you stay in that crucible, that competitive crucible, and uh, you learn the lessons and you let you just let reality do its work on you uh that heat and that pressure is going to do its work on you i think not not and not much uh different of analogy in the way that uh you know diamonds are made and the pressure of mountains and heat and pressure you know it's enough difficulty for long enough you either you it either kills you or it, it makes you better and uh fortunately for us we didn't go out of business and uh that heat and that pressure made us better made us really effective and I want to pass that on to anybody who's interested in taking that transitional challenge on themselves and transforming their own pressure washing business into something that you might consider to be an environmentally friendly and stormwater friendly pressure washing business. And uh, like we literally have fully committed to 0% discharge, 100% capture all the time. And uh, yeah. Uh, there's there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of information, and more importantly, there's a lot of simple things you can do for a very small amount of money uh, to to uh, drastically up your operational IQ and and the results you can provide, and uh, to give your customers a great result. And I want to share all that stuff with you guys. I guess over what would probably be at least a year or maybe longer, however long it takes us to go through this. I'm not really sure uh, the way we're going to go through the progression because I just have this, you know, this amount of uh, stuff in my head that we've learned over the last 10 years that I want to pass on. But there's there's so much. I think what we'll do is we'll let the community guide the progression of these videos, uh, you know, in the form of com comments or feedback, anything you guys want to know, we'll do a video about that next instead of something else. But I want to get to all of it, all kinds of stuff from rebuilding pressure pumps and uh, roots blowers, you know, the things that make your vacuum because these things just, you know, picking up wash water just ruins everything, rusts everything out. It's really hard on your equipment, but there's a lot of cool things you can do if you're clever to uh, make this stuff last and uh, not bleed you dry like a stuck pig, monetarily speaking. Let's see, uh, probably, uh, I think it would probably be appropriate to share with you guys a little bit of history about our company and how I got into this work. Um, I, I used to work for my dad's old family business and uh, wind up going out on my own just a few months before he passed away. And, and during those few months, he was, you know, he was going downhill pretty rapidly and basically just couldn't work anymore. And there wasn't really anything else left for me to do. Uh, in a lot of ways, his business kind of began to implode long before he passed away, but his business sort of disintegrated with him. And uh, I was just a young, young, dumb kid. I didn't really, you know, know anything about anything back then. But uh, I, I got my start in pressure washing uh, after a really bad climbing accident. You know, up here in the Northwest, like we all climbed all the time. That's all we did. You know, everybody up here, not everybody, but a lot of people up here are just rock climbers because we just have such uh, beautiful outdoors. That's what you do when you're, up, when you're not working, you go out and play outside. And I was just another one of those guys but uh, I'd gotten in a really bad climbing accident and a dude in another party above us had fallen off this route. He fell like 400 feet, bounced off two ledges and um, hit me on the way down, almost hit my Blair and killed her. And uh, that, that experience just kind of, you know, climbing was the reason why I got up out of bed every day is what I love to do. I thought I was going to do it for the rest of my life, only do that for the rest of my life. I was a very obsessive individual with, in, with respect to that. Uh, I, really with respect to everything, everything I do, I kind of geek out on. But after the accident, I just was like, ah, I better go find something else to do for a while. So went back home. I was basically on the road, living in my car, climbing full time. And I came back home and offered the, my dad some help. He had just gone out on his own with a little commercial janitorial business. He would broker janitorial work out to subcontractors. And uh, I offered to, you know, so I told him I was home and not going to be climbing for a while because I was all messed up. 
had actually gotten hurt a little bit too, needs some time to heal. So he uh, offered me a job working for him. I think he was just, he was paying me like 200 bucks a week and I would go around and check his accounts and make sure that the, you know, the people that were doing the janitorial work at night were doing what they were supposed to be doing and weren't missing stuff. And I would kind of act as a liaison between his customers and his contractors working for him, help him manage a little bit. But one of the customers he had, he had took with him when he went on his own was a large grocery store chain. And they would occasionally call him up, you know, every couple of weeks or something. You know, hey, John, go send somebody out to pressure wash store 495 or whatever. And, you know, do the sidewalks and the shopping carts. And uh, at a certain point, that, that customer was calling him more and more. And he asked me if I wanted to pressure wash. And I didn't know anything about pressure washing. But I said, yeah, I'd love to. And uh, basically jumped headfirst into pressure washing grocery stores. And that's really where I learned how to pressure wash. And uh, I, I'm a geek. I, I geek out on whatever I'm doing, whether, you know, like when I was in the army, I totally geeked out on soldiering. And when I was climbing, I just geeked out on climbing. And now that I was pressure washing, I geeked out on pressure washing. And I totally geeked out on pressure washing. I just jumped in feet first, learned everything I could. Um, you know, it's not a particularly hard thing to do, but there is a lot to learn when you go out on jobs and you're in different situations. And uh, I had a lot of fun doing it and uh, learned a lot. And, uh, and I think what happened at a certain point was the customer was like, you know, we're going to get rid of all our contractors who don't use hot water. And we just want to use companies that are using hot water. And are you guys willing to buy a hot water machine? And we said, fuck yeah, we'll buy a hot water machine. And we went and bought the nicest hot water machine we could find. I think we spent like 10 grand and bought a Hydrotech 3005, which was a 3000 PSI at five gallon per minute machine. And uh, I love that thing. It, it, it made my work about twice as fast in the even though they weren't particularly high in PSI or gallons per minute, they're way more efficient uh, just because of the way that they were set up on trailers with these bulk tanks and hose reels. And uh, these, the pumps were, uh, they, they were belt driven pumps instead of just being bolted directly onto the engines like most pressure washers. And they're more efficient and they put out way a lot more water and uh, they allow you to work a lot faster. And uh, that made my job a lot easier. And uh, so I started doing my work better and better. And the customer really liked what we were doing basically stopped using all their other contractors, called us up, actually called me directly one day. It was this uh, regional maintenance manager guy. And uh, he uh, basically, uh, he would always talk to my dad. He rarely ever talked to me unless it was some specific thing he wanted to know about some job. Uh, or, you know, so I saw something or whatever, if somebody was stealing something, he I might talk to him directly. But really he called me directly one day and he, he wanted to know if it was possible that we could do all his stores once a month. And there was like 120 of them at the time. And, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the entrepreneurial nature of the people in my family don't really ever say no to anything. And that's one of the things I learned from my dad. And, uh, really that was a huge opportunity and also a huge challenge, but we took it on with enthusiasm. And, uh, of course, I think like most people would at least attempt to, and uh, basically my dad's little commercial janitorial business blew up into this like million or $2 million a year pressure washing operation because of that phone call. It's one of those phone calls that every pressure washing contractor kind of dreams about. And that actually happened to us. And uh, we were like off to the races. And it was this huge thing because we had always been like really poor people, you know, just blue collar, uneducated worker people. And, um, you know, all, and then all of a sudden, we just, it was like a torrent of money was coming into our business, our family business, working for my dad. And uh, it was, uh, it was awesome. Well, that's all I can say about it. It was awesome. And uh, that was basically, uh, we did that for the next six or seven years, I think it was, until uh, something else happened to cause all that to go away. But during that time was like pressure washing college, <laughs> you know? I uh, really, I really uh, learned how to pressure wash in that time. I mean, when you do, uh, really, it was more than 120 jobs every month on just with that one, with that one customer. And of course, there was other customers on top of that one customer. But when you have that kind of volume of work, uh, that changes the way you do things, and uh, you uh, all kinds of bullshit goes away, and reality steps in, and you, reality does its work on you. And uh, we had the, this operation was extremely well run, and we had uh, we had three different uh, guys working for us, and they each had about thirty or forty stores that they would do at nights, and some of them in the mornings. And I ran that 
And uh, honestly, it was really good for a long time until it all came to an end. And uh, we were back then dabbling in reclamation. And uh, this really gets to the point of how I got into reclamation is, uh, you know, the uh, this grocery store chain was really happy with what we were doing. They loved us. We were we had a really close working relation working relationship with them. And then they just over time were just adding more and more and more. And my dad's business kept growing, growing, and growing. And uh, and my responsibilities also were growing, growing, growing. And um, one of the things that they added in at one point was that they were having problems with their trash compactors, and they wanted all those pressure washed with hot water, of course. And, uh, you know, the situation was at the time, uh, before us, actually, every, all the stores had like these open top dumpsters in the back. And, uh, but then some guy like behind a Trader Joe's, I guess, I think is what happened. Some dude jumped into a Trader Joe's dumpster that, who we weren't working for at the time. Uh, apparently this homeless guy or this poor kid or whatever, like jumped in the dumpster and got some beef jerky or something, or I don't know, something. And he got food poisoning and then turned around and sued Trader Joe's for getting food poisoning, for jumping in their dumpster and stealing their rotten food or whatever. And then, you know how laws are, I think some, it might have been some impetus in the, in the grocery store industry, or maybe there was some law that was passed by some politician trying to prevent homeless people from getting food poisoning. <laughs> so uh, all the stores suddenly, all grocery stores, started transitioning to enclosed trash compactors. And... Uh, but these things were just turned out to be an ecological nightmare because uh, it, what used to have an open top dumpster and then these things, you know, you throw the trash in over the top and they, but they would dry out. Even when it rained, they were never really much of a problem. But once you had this enclosed metal box, basically, uh, they would stay wet all the time and then rust out. And uh, not only that, things would decompose in a much nastier way because it was like this enclosed, you know, basically a fucking biohazardous capsule behind every grocery store and then these things would leak all this sludge on the ground and you know most of these grocery stores had like an apartment complex or some houses near the back of the store and they would complain to the store about the smell and these trash compactors just had to be a fucking disaster and uh they asked us to help them help uh, help them get a grip on that problem so we came up with this great big plan and we got them all on a schedule and we taken pictures and recording which ones were leaking and which ones were good and pretty much they all were leaking but we were in this big campaign to help them get a grip on this trash compactor situation. And part of that was pressure washing them. And so I would go out and like we did everything, we would make it really obvious where we worked and I would cut a line around these things. And then also around, they were also, they were almost always sit next to some storm drain in the loading dock because you've all seen a trash compactor probably if you've ever done one. You got the back of the store, the loading dock, and then in the loading dock off to the side is the trash compactor backed up against the building, which connects to a chute, which they throw the junk from inside so that nobody can possibly get inside these things. They're like an enclosed encapsulated system that you can only access from the inside of the store, except when the drivers pull these things out to go dump them. And, uh, but being in the loading dock, you know, it's like a concrete depression with a ramp and you have to have a drain down there or you wind up having a lake the next time it rains. So... I would clean off around the trash compactor and there would always just be this giant sludge going right to the drain, the storm drain. And back then we didn't know anything about storm water. We just thought storm drains were fucking holes in the ground that muddy water was supposed to go into. So we didn't have any qualms about pressure washing these things and flushing all that shit right down those drains, right into those catch basins. And then consequently out to whatever Creek or Lake those things drained out to, or whatever groundwater they were perforated to. And, uh, but I, I saw that, after a while, uh, I started seeing these stencils around, you know, on each storm drain, it would say, you know, something like dump no waste drains the local creek. And uh, I did like two or three of these things. And I went back and I was like, Dad, I don't think I'm supposed to be pressure washing these things. <laughs> they say it drains out to the local creek. This shit's nasty. I don't think we should be doing this. So, uh, you know, my dad was always like, yeah, fuck whatever. The whole green thing's a scam and just keep doing what you're doing. And I was like, come on, Dad, let me start. Let me figure out a way to pick up this wash water. And my dad was very antagonistic towards the government, but he loved me. And he, he agreed to get it. He agreed to start doing some kind of vacuum situation just because I wanted to do it. So he was just kind of humoring me and we were making so much money. He could, he didn't really care. He just wanted to be successful and, and he didn't want to rock the boat with me. And so he let me do that. And, uh, we tried a couple of shop back things, like a couple of little hydro tech. I think they were, we bought this stand up electric shop vac and i think i destroyed that thing and like on the first compact or like three hours it just completely blew out the motor on this thing trying to suck this garbage up 
and uh, was woefully under under designed. We got another one. I ruined that one. And then uh, then we found another one that had like a gas powered vacuum from a company called Steel Eagle, and made this one called the Fury Twenty Four Hundred, which is was actually a pretty decent wastewater vacuum uh, in its day. And it really uh, does really well today too. You can still get those things. And uh, that's basically how we got into it was uh, trash compactors. And then basically that was my first introduction to uh, the fact that you weren't really supposed to just pressure wash it and just flush it down the storm drain. So we didn't know anything about that, but then now we do. But this was more or less, you know, with my dad's company before he passed away, this was just like a novelty. And uh, when I went out on my own, that became priority number one. So when I went, when I started my own little business, that became my sole focus. And uh, I was resolved from the beginning to reclaim wash water in all situations where it was required or run that goddamn business into the ground trying. And uh, I knew it was gonna be uh, hard, but I was also naive enough to believe that I could pull it off. And um, so I went for it. And uh, it was in fact very much harder than I had thought it was gonna be. And I knew pretty much, I knew about the pressure wa pressure washing industry having already been in it for a few years, but was by no means um, experienced in business. All I knew was how to spray things off and clean stuff. And uh, uh, the, the reality of that transition turned out to be a huge, I, I gotta say, looking back, knowing what I know now, I might have, I might not have done it. Um, it was only my naivety and my youthful arrogance that kind of propelled me forward into that transition. But uh, I got to say, you know, what what that did to me, I might have just said, fuck this, I'm going to go climbing again and just do that. So, um, that leads me into really the, the reason why I want to do these videos is because that transition does not need to be as hard as it was for my little company because uh you know once a trail's been hacked through the bushes it's a lot easier to follow that trail and really that's kind of how the you know the rapid industrial expansion of the 20th century happened was people standing on the shoulders of those who've come before them so like i said in our business uh wastewater reclamation has, has now uh, been developed to a very high degree I've just kind of come up for air and looked around on the internet and just kind of see what's going on more and more lately now that I'm in the office more. And what I see when I look around is that the industry really is still in the very beginning stages of figuring this out. Whereas we're like very far down this path and I want to share with other contractors out there uh, what lies ahead of you. If you kind of stick with this transition or if you're committed to it and how you can do that with uh, a much less pain and financial uh expenditures and painful lessons than it was for us. I'm going to basically show you the shortcuts and uh, and and uh, provide the information and the resources so that you guys can, uh, if you want, do some or all of what we've done and transform your own little business into um, a specialty cleaning outfit that will uh, be prepared to move into what, uh, what things are going to be in the next century. So, um, yeah, I'm real excited about that. Um, there's a lot of things I want to share. There's going to be a ton to go over. I mean, everything from pressure pumps and roots blowers to surface cleaner bearings, eliminating tiger stripes, um, all the nuance that uh, that is forced upon you when you start picking up wash water. We're going to help you out with all of that. And I'm really not sure how we're going to progress through the different topics. There's so much. There's so many exact things I want to get across to you guys and share. But I think what we'll do is we'll probably let the community guide the progression of the videos in the form of questions. So if you have something you want to know about specifically, I think what I'll do is uh, probably do another video where we'll talk about all the individual aspects that I want to go over and then uh, let people pick from those. And we'll we'll just make that the next the subject of the next video. So uh, all kinds of cool shit. We're going to show you how to uh, make your surface, your vacuum surface cleaner bearings basically last forever. We're going to show you how to modify them so you can spin up their RPMs and they'll never wear out. You maybe have to do a seal kit once a year or something. We're going to show you how to rebuild a roots blower, how to take apart a gummed up rusted out roots blower, which is like the thing that makes your vacuum and clean that thing out, put it back together. We're going to show you guys how to rebuild pressure pumps because all the kind of stuff, do unloader valves, all the shit that wastewater just ruins. 
we're going to show you how to get past all those logistical challenges so uh, you don't just have to be constantly replacing your equipment because uh, when you get into reclamation, you find out that wastewater just ruins everything. It rusts everything out, fucking breaks everything. And uh, we're going to show you how to deal with all that. Not only that, we're also going to show you guys how to get into reclamation without buying a huge system and just buying some very simple tools you can find anywhere that will allow you to actually say we're going to do this with 0% discharge, 100% capture, and actually do it without letting any water get away with simple things like filling trash bags full of water to maybe sticking a traffic cone upside down in a drain pipe to totally block it up. There's all kinds of little things you can do with shit you've already got to start reclaiming wash water and uh, not have anything go down the drains. You don't need much at all. You can do this shit with a little cheap shop back and some 50 gallon drums and just stuff you can find anywhere. And uh, for the entrepreneurial spirit, if you're uh, anything cut from any kind of cloth like we are, uh, none of this stuff will be very hard for you. It's just, it's almost like, aha, it's like that kind of stuff, you know, the really good solutions are the ones that are so simple and don't really take anything. And I want to share all that with you guys. So again, uh, my name is Ben Shrope with Mechanized Cleaning Solutions, Inc. I highly encourage anyone who's uh, going to be interested in this video series to go check out our website at www.mechanizedcleaningsolutions.com. Go check out the services pages. Um, I like to do really thorough bids, but I, I got sick and tired of typing up, a, you know, like a six page book report every time somebody asked me to do a give them a price on something because I like to do really thorough bids. So what I did was I started standardizing our bids and making templates. And then eventually what I did was I just put the methodologies on our website and you can read those. And, and they're very general, but you can get an idea of how we're doing stuff. If you can kind of read between the lines, you'll be able to pick up a lot of information on our website and uh give you guys uh we'll also do uh maybe we'll do a tour one day we'll show you all of the custom built equipment that we have i mean basically we're running like little mini vac trucks now we just we don't even buy the machines you can buy anymore because they're just they're just under designed you're gonna wind up building your own shit and uh but even that is not an impossible thing to do because if i can do that shit anybody can and uh yeah so we'll go on uh we'll show you guys uh we'll give you a window into what awaits you if you uh, put your head down and you decide to stick with this transition and commit to it, uh, you'll be supremely positioned in the industry and especially in your own area as a specialty contractor who can do what other companies can't do. And uh, you'll be able to make some really great, uh, really great uh, 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 adjustments to your bottom line. You'll be able to charge more for the work that you're doing, especially if you're like one of the only guys in the area that can do it. You know, we're not the only ones in our area that can do this kind of work, but really uh there's nobody really doing it like we're doing it i mean we're really kind of in a in our own little arena now so uh yeah it was really rough in one sense you know you know operating in a very just you know very cutthroat competitive market but then you know there's a way in which if you stick with this transition you can transcend all of that and then just step into your own little arena and then once you're in that space um you have a lot more ability to control your own destiny in business and uh you know um your services will be in demand because you'll be basically um in a situation that really i think you know if you're a little bit of a, a, a front runner or an early adopter there are advantages to that there are advantages to getting out ahead of the curve ahead of time instead of waiting or being forced to make that transition later by some you know governmental regulating authority and uh and it's also it's it's a really satisfying thing to do you know when a customer calls you up and says yeah you know my contractor got in trouble and i just need somebody to come out here and do it the right way and you get to be that guy so that's a lot of fun too you get to do a lot of showing off and um and uh it'll be fun uh contributing to hopefully a large degree but even if it's just a small degree an elevation of the entire pressure washing industry across the board <coughs> by sharing this information so uh, I think we'll cut it off there for now, and uh, the next video we'll do, uh, we'll do a real general, there's actually two things I want to do for the next video. What I want to do is take you guys on a tour of what, of what the proper equipment setups look like, the basic things that you need. We'll take you a tour of our trucks and our trailers. We'll show you what the machines look like that can actually go anywhere and do anything. And then what I really want to do is I want to do uh, basically sit down in front of a chalkboard or a whiteboard one day. And uh, I want to get into like basically the one-on-one stuff, you know, like the theory of reclamation and then the reality. Find out what the differences are 
and uh, so we can get that theory out of your head and make room for reality because that is going to be the single biggest challenge to making this transition effectively. So uh, yeah, we'll think about doing, uh, we'll do an equipment tour for the next video and then, uh, then we'll start attacking individual topics. Topics about surface cleaners, about reclamation gun melters, surface cleaner bearings, rebuilding different components, important components like pressure pumps and roots blowers. Uh, we'll do an entire city series on how to eliminate tiger stripes and methods of vacuum surface cleaning so that you can basically, uh, ba basically reduce the amount of water that you're picking up. We'll show you ways of separating all the sand and the mud and the rocks from the wash water so it's easier to process. Get psyched, people. There's a ton of shit we're going to go over. I'm really excited. I'm Ben Shrope with Mechanized Cleaning Solutions. I'll see you soon.